All right. So <clears throat> my name is Micah, and I am going to be talking about working with version control today. So if you have any questions or specific things that you would like to hear more about, I know we haven't covered anything yet, but it's always good to get a general idea of, of kind of what people are expecting to get out of this. Um, the chat is the place to do that. So if you want to go ahead and just post, you know, maybe what you're expecting this to be today. Uh, if I need to, I could potentially adapt it a little bit. Um, but uh, but yeah, generally the chat is the place you'll go to ask questions uh, as we go through. I've got the chat open on another screen, so I'll try to keep an eye on that uh, while we go through the slides uh, and then go from there. So yeah, and so as far as uh, working as a solo developer with version control, a lot of my talking points are kind of in that direction because that's where I was when I started working with version control. Uh, so hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully we cover that well enough. Um, let's see. Yeah, so we do have some best practices that we'll be covering. Um, and then, of course, for those that have no idea what it is, uh, we will introduce the concepts and even do a little bit of a demo, I think, here in the middle of our middle of the talk. So um, and we do cover multiple workflows and kind of the pros and cons of of what those are. So that's looks like everything that's been mentioned so far is is in the in the queue. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this should be pretty on track. Uh, so like I said, my name is Micah. Um, I'm a WordPress developer at Bluehost and you can basically Google WP Scholar to find me online. Um, everything from my website to Twitter to WordCamp talks and everything in between. So a few things we will kind of hit on from like a definition standpoint, just to make sure it's clear what we're talking about and, and some of the tools that we're referencing. Uh, so version control in general uh, is basically the practice of uh, using particular software to track and manage changes that you make to your code. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's the idea of version control is just being able to track these changes, right? Uh, so, one of the tools that we use to do that is something called Git. Uh, Git is an industry standard tool for version control. It is a CLI tool, uh, and it is also a free and completely open source tool as well. So that is has a lot to do with why it's an industry standard. Uh, but ultimately, Git is uh, what most developers are going to use when you talk about version control. There are other con version control systems, particularly if you do WordPress core development or work on WordPress plugins, you will probably encounter uh, SVN. Um, but we won't really hit on the specifics of that. Uh, but the concepts that we cover as far as version control will basically apply to any other system. Um, and then we have something called GitHub. So if you're using Git, uh, GitHub is a cloud-based service where we as developers can store, manage, and share code. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, Git and GitHub are kind of the tools that we're going to be using. Uh, and like I said, Git is a CLI tool. Uh, and for those who want to follow along later with our demo, uh, if you want to go ahead and download, there's a tool called Source Tree, which is a, <clears throat> a free uh, cross-platform tool that you can use, which gives you a good UI. Um, GitHub has its own tool. I'm not a huge fan of it. I prefer Source Tree. Um, but there are plenty of tools out there that you can use for version control. So I uh, want to make sure that uh, you're aware, but I'll be using Source Tree. And thank you, Michael, for posting the link for that in the chat. <clears throat> um, yeah, and CLI stands for Command Line Interface. So if that's not clear to anybody, um, that basically means you'll go into the terminal in your computer and be able to type commands. Uh, um, so if you're first learning Git, uh, Git slash version control, 
you'll want to have a UI tool that you can use for that. So why should we use version control? Uh, so first of all, you can track changes in your project. Uh, so it's a, a way to keep track of every change that happens, um, or at least the important ones. Uh, there are kind of some ways to kind of clean up the history a little bit. Um, but ultimately, it's a way for you to keep track of those changes. If you're an individual developer, this is good just because you can see every little change that you, you made and when you made it. Um, and the other thing about being a uh, solo developer, I mean, obviously this works with teams as well, but is the ability to undo a specific change or roll back to a certain point at any given time. So you can basically say, oh, there's a bug. Let me undo the last change, see if that particular state of the application works. If not, you can undo some more. You can roll back and roll forward and, and kind of jump around until you figure out where, where that issue came from. Um, <clears throat> it kind of serves as a code backup as well. Gives you a safe, clean copy of all the code that you touch. Uh, so if something gets hacked, uh, you know that you have a clean copy of it in your um, repository, essentially. Um, <clears throat> it gives you the ability to try new things. So basically, you're able to create deviations of the stable code uh, just to try stuff, just to see if it works. If it works, you can run with that code. If it doesn't work, you can trash it, uh, and it won't impact your production code. Um, and as we mentioned, it helps you to find breakages. Uh, so if you do have bugs that sneak in, a lot of times we don't notice them right away. Sometimes bugs can linger in our code for weeks or months. Um, and being able to, like I said, roll back to a pretty good point and, and find when that bug didn't exist or, <laughs> um, you know, when it was fixed, maybe it was broken again, who knows. Um, and then teamwork, right? So we have uh, version control is gonna make it easy for you to work with a team of people um, who might actually edit the same files without having to worry about losing your work. So unfortunately there are still web agencies out there uh, that uh, <laughs> don't actually use version control. They'll jump into the server and change files uh, on the live site and it makes me cringe, but uh, you know, all it takes is two people changing the same file and, and you trash the other person's work. Uh, so with version control, that kind of thing doesn't happen. Um, and that is also why I tell people, if you have a developer that doesn't use version control, find a new developer, uh, because I think everyone should be <laughs> using version control. Um, but even if you are just a one person uh, working on a project, you might have multiple computers, maybe you um, you know, have your desktop computer, you have a laptop that you travel with, or whatever the case may be, you can actually, makes it easy to work across those multiple multiple computers. Um, but again, there's still plenty of benefit, even if you just use a single computer and do all your work, um, being able to track all those changes across the project. Um, <clears throat> so version, uh, version control lets you do code reviews. Uh, so you can have someone else look at your code. Um, However, I even review my own code by uh, creating PRs on my own repositories and, uh, you know, sleep on it, come back the next day, look at it with fresh eyes um, and kind of do my own code review um, in that way. Uh, the other thing that's great is the version control. You can actually integrate it with different deployment tools and that can help you streamline your code deployment and basically prevent human error. Um, it is very easy to make a mistake in deployments. And so having that automated uh, will save you not just a bunch of time, but a, a bunch of potential heartache should something go wrong. <clears throat> so, um, so that's why we should use it. We're going to take a look now at some of the basic concepts. So, um, so the first concept uh, or idea behind version control is we have what is called a repository, also shorthand repo. Uh, it's nothing more than an instance of the project that's stored either on your local computer 
or remotely on some service like GitHub. Uh, so it contains a collection of all the changes that you made on the project. You can think of it as a database of changes, right, that lives in a particular location. So then we have uh, what we call cloning. So cloning is when you basically copy a repository from one place to another. Typically, you're copying from a remote repository from a place like GitHub to your local machine. So when you do that clone, it's grabbing it from this particular location and pulling it to your local computer. And then we have what we call a commit. So a commit is when you've made some code change on your local machine and you want to basically store that change into this database, into this repository. Um, so you will, you know, you can commit an individual file, you can commit individual lines of code, uh, but ultimately you'll select the files or lines of code that you want in the commit. And then you can leave a commit message basically saying, you know, I changed this because blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you can make that commit and that basically gets stored into this repository. Um, and then, <clears throat> so we've made a change on our local, right? So we have a local copy of our repository that we've copied from say GitHub. Um, so we've made a change, we've done a commit, and now we wanna take the changes that we've made locally and push them up to our remote repository on a service like GitHub. Uh, so pushing is nothing more than saying, hey, Here's all the stuff I've changed. I'm going to send it up to the remote repository where it's then able to be shared with other developers uh, or you know, code reviews and things like that can happen. And then we have the pool, right? So if somebody else has made changes, maybe you're on vacation and now you're back and there's been a bunch of changes, you need to pull those things down. Uh, so pulling is nothing more than grabbing whatever those changes are from the remote repository and pulling them down. Ideally, when you pull code, you should do that on a regular basis. So you don't want to be waiting weeks at a time to pull code down and then realize that you have, you know, very different, uh, you, you know, the more changes that happen that you have to reconcile, um, the more of a beast it is to kind of deal with those, those conflicts. So the more often that you can pull the code in and deal with things at a smaller scale, it gets to be a lot easier. Um, so you do want to pull code um, you know, at least once a day, in my opinion. Then we have what we call branches. So branches allow you to basically create a divergence from the production version of the code. And they are usually created so that you can create a new feature or fix a particular bug. And the idea is that you create this branch, you do your work, and then when it's done, you'll essentially merge it back into the production code. So merging is the act of combining two different branches into a single branch and may also require reconciling any conflicting changes. So like I said, if uh, someone hasn't changed the same files, then there's probably no conflict. But if two people touch the same file, particularly the same line inside of the same file, you're going to have some sort of um, merge conflict. So you'll have to kind of deal with that. And then we have what's called a pull request. So a pull request is essentially an event um, where a contributor uh, will ask a maintainer of a repository to review code, right? So if I wanted to, for example, contribute to the um, Gutenberg project for the WordPress editor uh, that lives on GitHub, uh, I would have to create a copy or a fork of the Gutenberg repository, I would then clone a copy of my fork, <laughs> which would live on GitHub, to my local computer. I would then make my changes, commit them, push them up. They would now live in my fork or my copy on GitHub. And then I have to find a way to get that from my fork into the original repo that WordPress uh, manages. So in that case, I'd create a pull request from my fork or copy of the repo to the WordPress uh, Gutenberg project. And then if that is approved, that would get merged essentially into the WordPress uh, Gutenberg project. And then I will have 
contributed to to the project. So that's we'll look more. We have some visuals for this later, but uh, just as an example of of uh, what how you might use a pull request. And then we have uh, what are called tags. These are basically just labels that you assign to a specific commit in a in the repository's history. And they basically um, can be used for anything really, but usually are used to tag specific versions. So if you're doing a release for version 1.0.0 um, and then 1.0.1 and so on, uh, those are the kinds of tags that you might use for saying, hey, you know, this commit marks the end of version X. Um, so that is what those would normally be used for. And GitHub actually has a uh, concept of a release, which is associated with a tag. So tagging uh, is a fine way of indicating where a, uh, a version, you know, lives or what commit makes up that version. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but it's better if you're using GitHub to actually do a release and associate it with a, a version tag. Um, because you get a few other things with that, but anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna run through a little bit of a demo. So let me see here. So this is Source Tree. Uh, hopefully, everybody can see that, and it's not too small. I know I have a big screen. So, um, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna say new. We're gonna do and a. You, uh, sorry, Michael. Yeah. Is there, uh, I mean, sorry, Micah. Is there a way for you to enlarge even more? Um, because it's only uh, filling part of the screen. Yeah, I can make it all the way big, but I don't know if that's going to make any of the text bigger. Uh, I think it's uh, probably see. more helpful this way. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so this is the source tree. When you first open it up, uh, you'll have kind of this panel. And then, um, you know, you can you can do a number of things. So. Uh, here we'll say, I want to create a new, you can create a new uh, repository on your local machine. Um, you can create a new repository remotely. I think you do have to link this up to your GitHub for that to work. And you can also clone from a URL. So before we get into that, I'm going to jump back into my, where my browser tab went. I think I might have, might have lost it when I was doing this here. Hold on. Um, where did my where did my browser tag go? All right. Well, I'll open a new one, I guess. Let's see. Surely it's in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay. I was just in full screen mode here, I think. Okay. So I'm going to go to github.com slash WP Scholar. That's my GitHub. And we're going to find a uh, repository that is called Hello World. Hello. Um, so this is kind of the repository I use to test all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there's stuff in here and <laughs> nothing important. Um, so if you want to create a new repository, you would, um, you know, you'd need to have an account with GitHub, so you have to sign up, and then you would be able to come over here and say new repository, uh, and then that would uh, take you to a screen where you give it a name. You can make it public or private. I think if you um, can't remember, it, uh, you may have to have a paid account to do private repos, but public repos are free. Um, but anyway, so. If you want to create a new repository, that's how you would go about doing it. Mainly just give it a name and hit create. Uh, in this case, we have a repository. It's got some code in it, so we're going to run with this. Um, so if you have an existing repository, you'll be able to click this code button, and it will give you a URL. Now, generally, uh, you have two options. You have the clone with HTTPS and clone with SSH. Um, so HTTPS works fine. The only thing there is if you clone with that, every time you make a commit or try to do a push or a pull or a fetch or all the different things that you 
need to do, it'll make you type in a password. Um, now, source tree can remember your passwords for you, so there's that. Um, but in my opinion, um, I prefer SSH, which does require a little bit of extra setup. Uh, so you would have to, uh, you know, set up some SSH keys on your local computer, and then you would have to upload your public key to the GitHub settings. Um, we're not really going to get into all that because it's not really specific to version control directly, uh, although it is something that you'll probably want to do. This basically means that you have some SSH keys on your machine, and anytime you run a command against a, a Git repo, it just works, no password required, um, and you can you can run with that. So we're just going to copy the SSH URL since I already have that set up. And then we're going to jump back over to source tree and we're going to create a new uh, repository, but we're going to, so we're going to clone from a URL. And so we're going to say, okay, this is the source URL and we're going to call this hello world. And it's just going to go into our uh, user directory here. So this kind of does all that automatically for us. You can change it if you like. Uh, there's a little dot, dot, dot icon to the right, which will let you go find the folder that you want to put it in or things like that. Uh, so we'll hit clone and this will create a copy of that on your machine. So you can see it kind of opened up a new window here and this window has a bunch of stuff in here. Now, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and say uh, as a best practice, if you make a code change, the word test is a really bad description of that. But again, this is just me playing around and testing random stuff that no one's really supposed to see. Um, but it's also, we're going to use it as an example of what you shouldn't do. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to um, kind of go through some of the actions that you might normally do with a repository, right? So visually, you can see we have something called a master branch. Now, technically, this is a much older repo, but um, a lot of the newer repositories that I create actually use main as the main branch, whereas master is kind of the traditional name. Um, it does have some negative connotations. So uh, GitHub has kind of been moving towards having main as the default branch name. Um, but if you do see master, main, or even trunk, uh, those are usually kind of the same thing. They usually indicate the primary branch of code that would represent where all of the production code would live. Um, so let's say we wanted to, to do some work here. So as an individual developer, you can see I've literally just made a change, committed, made a change, committed, made a change, committed. At any time, I could I could uh, double click here and it'll say, are you sure you want to change to this copy of the code? Hit OK. And boom, you are at this state of the code instead of way up here. Uh, so any of these changes, they don't exist right now in the code that, that I have. Um, so let me do this just so that we have a, a reference here. So this is, so you can hit the terminal button. Oh, let me do that again, just for anybody who missed it. Um, so in source tree, there's a button here for terminal. You can click that, it opens your terminal. If you do want to run some CLI commands, uh, git commands, you can do that. Um, you can always do things like git status, and it will tell you, you know, the current state of things, if there's files that have changes, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> so colored things at the top of the tags. Um, okay, yeah. So the question was, what are what are these these colorful things up here? So the branches will get different colors, and and this is actually a, the red thing that forks off here is actually a separate branch. Uh, so we have different colors. These things here, these are tags essentially. Um, well, kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're they're essentially any tags that we add will look like this, um, but these right now are representing the state of master uh, branch 
So if you see origin slash master, origin represents the uh, original source of the code, which is actually on GitHub. Uh, and then if it just says master, that represents the local version of the code. So master on remote and master on local match up. Um, and so this is, uh, and then we have this special thing called head. So we have origin head, which is the current state of the code. And as you can see, our local head is now in a different state from origin head. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit, little bit more sense. Uh, but yes, if I had tagged, say, a 1.0 version here, you might you would see something colorful like this. I would say 1.0. Um, and those, yeah, the colorful things, they're all added by source tree. Um, so we'll we'll get into tagging a little bit more here in a second. Um, but I do want to pull this one up. Um, and then I'm just going to do open dots. That's going to open my finder window to here. So this is the code uh, that uh, lives in this repository. Um, so source tree has this really cool thing where you can actually, um, if you set it up, you can actually type s tree space dot and it opens up from terminal directly into here. Um, if you use open dot, it'll open from terminal into your folder. And then um, uh, let's see, what was I trying to do here? Um, <clears throat> Oh yeah, and then code space dot, if you use VS code, will actually open it into the code. So it's kind of a nice little shortcut because you can always hit the terminal button from source tree, which you can then access the finder or uh, VS code directly. So this is our code in VS code that just opened up. So we can see we have a hello world file and um, apparently haven't updated that in a few years, a copy right here. So let's just say we want to change some stuff. But before we do that, like I said, we've, um, where'd it go? Got a lot of, a lot of files going, uh, windows going on. So we're going to, we're going to jump back up here to, uh, I'm just going to double click over here on the left where it says master. And that will switch us back to the master branch. So this puts us here. So you'll notice that the bold text indicates kind of what commit you're on. And this is the one here. So let's see if uh, the copyright change. Copyright didn't change. So let's say, hey, we want to change the copyright. So we can come in here and we can say, okay, 2022. Obviously, that's not the current year, but we're just going to go around a little bit. So I'm going to save that. And then we're going to switch back over to um, source tree. As you can see, we have this thing that says uncommitted changes. And we have a little gray line here. I'm going to click to file status, and this will show us uh any file changes that have happened so you can see we have the hello world php and we have this uh you know copyright change so to commit this code because this code isn't saved in the repository at all until we commit it so we have to select the code that we want to commit and then we have to add some sort of message um, update copyright and then we'll hit commit and that will commit it. Now, as you can see, we have this little arrow pointing up with a one. Basically, it's saying, hey, your master branch is one ahead from the origin master. So this is the node here. And we follow that up to here. We can see that we're one ahead on our local. So in order to get that bit of code up here, so let's open up this Hello World PHP on GitHub. And we can see here, we have the old 2021 still here, even though we just changed it and committed it, uh, we haven't pushed that code to GitHub. So to do that, we'll hit the push button and we will, um, you know, we have origin, which is gonna be our GitHub URL. You can kind of see it maybe faintly here. Um, and it's gonna go to master branch or from our local master branch to the remote master branch. You can actually change these things around, but typically they should match up. So we're just gonna hit okay. <clears throat> so that's pushing it up to GitHub. So now if I were to refresh this on GitHub, we should see, there we go, a new 2022 year. 
Um, so let's see, source tree, a tool instead of, or in addition to VS Code. Uh, I would say it is an addition to. So typically you'll have your code editor and then you'll have uh, a way to manage your version control. You could do, like I said, you could do it from the terminal, um, but you have to be really good with knowing and formulating the commands for all of that. Um, but so source tree would be the, the visual tool that I think makes makes it much easier um, to work with version control. Um, so we've seen the idea of cloning a repo. So we pulled the repo down from GitHub to our machine. We've made some changes. We've done a commit. We've pushed back up to GitHub. Um, let's look at maybe a couple of other workflow items here real quick. So <clears throat> let's say uh, that this update copyright represents uh, a version 1.0 of our application. Uh, so what we could do is we can right click here and we can hit tag and tag, we can give it a name. So we can say 1.0.0 and then, um, yeah, so VS Code, Source Tree, GitHub, all those three things combined. Uh, yeah, they were, they, they're, definitely a, a good pairing together. Uh, so we hit, well, let's see, we want to push this tag. So we can create a tag that only lives on our local copy. Um, but I'm going to check this so that it makes sure to get the tag up to GitHub at the same time that we add it. So we're going to add. And as you can see, we have a new, and, and like I said, I'm not really sure how to make this text actually bigger, but uh, we're seeing a 1.0.0 tag here in the blue. Uh, and if we were to go over to GitHub, just go back to the main main section here. So we have five branches, 50 tags. Now, technically I've, I've made many tags. So I don't know if 1.0.0 uh, is a duplication. <laughs> um, I don't think it would let me create two tags with the same name. But as you can see, um, there are many tags uh, that I've created in the past, but none was 1.0.0. Uh, I created a 1.0. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, the, the concept of tagging is just to um, kind of bookmark a specific state of the code so that you can get back to it. So for versions, it makes a lot of sense to say, hey, version one is this, version two is that. Um, but commits, uh, you might have 100 commits in a single, um, uh, essentially what you would call a release, right? So any any changes you made since version one, uh, you could have multiple commits before version two, right? Uh, so in this case, um, you know, you can also go to GitHub and create a release. And a release usually will create a tag as well. So we can say we wanted to do a release for the 1.0.0 tag that already exists, Let's call it the version 1.0.0. So this would be a way that you would actually do a release. And if the tag didn't exist, you could do a, a release and it would create the tag. So that's just another way of essentially doing the same thing. Generally, the, the reason you would tag a version is so that um, if you're using a tool like Composer or if you're uh, for PHP or NPM for JavaScript, um, creating a version will allow you to pull that code into other things. Um, but yeah, so committing is very different from tagging. Committing is more of the day-to-day -day action. Tagging is more of a, we're ready to release something. We should tag a version of the code. So let's take a look here at a slightly different workflow. So let's say, hey, we want to create a new feature. Uh, let's create a branch. So I'm going to click the, for those that missed it, click this uh, branch button. And that's going to say, hey, let's create a new branch. We just got to give it a name. Uh, I like to use a, um, uh, well, there's something called Git flow, and there's kind of a naming. And within source tree, uh, if you name the branch a particular way, it'll actually create nested 
uh, folders for you. So I can call, I can create a branch and just give it a name like test or something, right? Um, and that, that would be fine. But in this case, we're going to say update slash, and we'll call it copyright. So we're going to treat the copyright update as a feature in this case, and it creates a branch. And as you can see, we have an update folder now with copyright inside because we named it update slash copyright. It creates a folder. And so it just gives it an easy way to find things and collapse things down. Usually I'll follow a, a convention of saying update slash, try slash, add slash, fix slash, things like that. Um, so you can kind of classify things that are that are enhancements versus bug fixes versus uh, just experiments. So what we're going to do now is so we are on this copyright branch. So let's go edit our code again. So I'm going to switch back to VS Code here. And we're going to change this to the correct year. So we're going to change this from 2022 to 2023. And we'll save that. And then we'll jump back over to source tree here. And <clears throat> so we can see we have uncommitted changes. We come to file status. And again, we have this hello world file with a copyright changing from 2022 to 2023. So we're going to check that and we're going to commit it. So we're going to say update copy right again <laughs> in this scenario. All right. So we're going to commit that change. Right now we could we could make multiple changes. So let's say um um oh shoot, you know, we forgot to change this version number. Uh maybe this version number should be 1.3.0. Uh and of course we have that in two places here, so we'll update that. So then we come back to source tree, you know, we got some more changes. So we're just gonna call this um bump version. And so that'll that'll add these changes here. Now, if I wanted to, I could do one line of code at a time. So this is unstaged. This is staged. We've staged a single line of code uh, in the same file and decided that we're not going to stage this one. Um, in this scenario, they, they're related changes, so we'll keep them together. Um, but you do have the option of, of selecting specific lines of code in a file. So we'll do a commit, we bump the version. So now we've made two commits. So if we come back to the copyright branch, we can see, okay, from 1.0.0, we made a copyright change and then we bumped a version and that's the current state of our code. So again, we're working on a branch. So this branch is called update slash copyright. So if I were to do a push, it would say, well, what do you want to push? I want to push the update slash copyright to origin, which is the GitHub um, copy of that. So we're going to push it to update copyright on the remote branch. Hit OK. So what that will do is that will create a new branch. And it even tells you here as I load GitHub back up. Update slash copyright had recent pushes less than a minute ago. So if I'm looking at the list of branches, you can see we have the master branch. We have this update slash copyright branch. If I wanted to see the state of the code in this branch, I could click on this and it would show me the state of the code for this branch, which includes the version bump that we did to 1.3.0. But if I just went to the repo and I'm looking at the state of the master branch, and I go into the hello world file, we're not gonna see the recent uh, version number or uh, copyright because that's on a, it's not in the production code yet, right? So we've created a divergence from the production code uh, that lives in its own little isolated location. So with that being the case, um, we will, and I'll get to that question here in just a second, um, so with that being the case, this uh, we want to do what we call a pull request. So the, the pull request is, again, a tool that we use uh, to do code review. And I like to use them to code review myself, even if I'm not working with a team on something. So here, 
Uh, now I've set up stuff that it pre-populates a lot of stuff. You'll probably come in when you create your pull request and it'll look more like this. Um, but you'll say, you know, maybe prep for version 2.0 or something, It'd be whatever you want to call it. Um, and so you can say, well, hey, you know, I um, updated the copyright, uh, updated version numbers. Uh, so those are the things that we did. If you're working with a team, you can even say, hey, I, I want to pick some people here to review my code. You can assign this to yourself. Uh, you can add some labels. So you say, hey, this was uh, an enhancement, for example. Uh, but ultimately, it'll show us, you know, here's all the changes that uh, are different from what's on the master or production branch of the code. So this shows us um, all of those changes. So when we create the pull request, what it will do is look something like this. And so it'll it'll sh give you a place where you can have some conversations. Um, it will show you the specific commits that happened. If there's any checks, uh, there's something called GitHub Actions, which is really nice, but we're not gonna get into that. It can run checks. Um, and then we have the code. You can see the specific files and things that were changed. Um, so let's say we, we were doing a code review. We pop in here and say, hey, uh, you know, at WP Scholar, that's me. Uh, are we sure this is <laughs> the right year? <laughs> uh, you've changed this a few times, right? Uh, <laughs> so we can start a review. Um, and then, you know, when we're done, we could finish that review and we could say, okay, well, we, we have some changes or this is just a comment. Um, and so that makes it easy for you to interact with other people. Um, whether they're on your team or they're just people on the internet that you said, hey, can you come look at my thing? Um, you know, if you're learning code, you can you can use PRs for having a mentor look at your code or things like that. Um, so that's just a, a few uh, quick things that you can do uh, with the code. So let's actually jump back to the slide deck here and kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, when do you create a branch? What do the workflows look like? Some of that kind of stuff. So uh, typically when you create a new branch, the idea is that you're working on a new feature or you're trying to fix a specific bug. So you might branch and you say, oh, I'm gonna fix this bug. And then you realize it's a one line change. Um, so your branch only has one line changed in your code and that's fine. Um, somebody could, could review that. Um, but it's also possible you're working on a new feature and there's hundreds of lines of code that are uh, are changing. Uh, and at some point, you're going to need to get that back into the main production branch. Um, but, you know, you'll, you might want to code review before that happens, right? Because when you're changing lots of code, it's easy to miss stuff. And it's always better to have a two, two sets of eyes. Um, but we're going to kind of talk through just some of the workflows that you might actually use. So this is what I call a basic workflow. It's it's where most people start when they first use version control. Um, all the commits are made to the main branch. As you saw, I had that very straight line um, in source tree of all of the things that I had done. Um, and so anything that's uh, changed upstream, a lot of times it gets ignored until you are trying to push stuff up and you realize that you didn't pull other people's stuff down, if that's the case. Um, Sometimes it happens when you're working across multiple computers, right? You made some changes here, and then you made some changes there, and then realize you forgot to pull the changes that you had made from the other computer. Um, so, uh, but ultimately, you're just working in a very straight line fashion. So your your branch changes are going to look like this. You're not really creating separate branches. You're working on one branch, and you're committing in a very uh, serialized fashion. So the pros of this is it's easy to understand. It's really great for small projects. Uh, and, and you know it, it works with teams as well, uh, as long as there's not too much activity. The more activity that you get on a repository, then the more 
conflicts and and the more this this approach is not really ideal so if you're first starting out um you know you don't need to do anything super special the most important thing is you track the individual changes you have the ability to roll back and you're learning about version control <laughs> as you um whoops i guess i should be in slideshow mode here um so then as you're um kind of advancing a little bit uh, scaling up with a team or whatever the case may be, um, you know, you can start to uh, change things a little bit. So we have what we call the feature branch workflow. And so this is where we're talking about the, the whole idea of creating a new branch when you're working on something new, uh, whether that's a new feature or fixing a bug, uh, you'll create a branch for each of those things individually. So this is where we have our master branch and we have commits and things happening here. Uh, but you can see that we're taking a feature here, we're working on it. It's a very easy thing to work on, maybe a one-line bug fix, and then eventually that goes back up into master. Um, and maybe somebody else had some other thing that came in during that time. Maybe they were working on some other feature and it got you know bumped into this dot. Um, so at some point, you know, that feature will merge back in. Um, and of course, you can have uh, you know a longer term feature, something that's going to take a while, and it it could go I don't know hundreds of commits, and then eventually make it back up into master. Um, so this is a basic feature branch workflow where you're creating a branch for a specific uh, purpose, and then when that purpose has been served, it gets merged back into the main or master branch. Um, so pros and cons of this. Uh, the whole idea there is that the main branch represents your production code, production ready code. So at any given time, you should be able to deploy what is in the master branch at any state and everything should work and nothing should be broken. Um, by doing all of your feature work and your bug fixes and things in their own branches, um, by the time that comes back around to the main production branch, uh, it will be production ready. Um, <clears throat> So then uh, the, the other nice thing about the feature branch workflow is that it really helps with collaboration and code review, right? Because now you're actually able to use the, the branch that you created to create a pull request on GitHub. Somebody can then go in and comment and go back and forth with uh, comments on the code. And then if things need to change before they finally get merged in, um, you know, all those things can happen. Uh, the, the big con here is that the longer the branch goes uh, before it gets merged back in. So if there's a lot of activity on master branch, there's a lot of activity on your feature branch, and then you have been working on it for three months, and then you decide to merge it in, it's going to be a, a little bit of work to deal with all the potential conflicts. Um, so we have a question here, when working on a feature branch, how do you handle changes to the main branch? Would you incorporate the main branch changes into your feature branch? And the answer there is yes, right? So at any given time, let's say I'm working on this feature branch here, this little blue one, um, you know, on a daily basis, I should really be pulling master branch into my feature branch. So if you're following that, uh, then you're kind of eliminating the con here of, having two branches that are going for quite a while without any, um, uh, what do you call it, integration along the way. Um, but if you're properly pulling from master uh, into your feature branch and dealing with conflicts as they arise on a daily basis, even if it takes six months to work on your feature, by the time you're ready to merge it back into master, it shouldn't be a big deal uh, because you've been handling, handling those changes. So then we have something called Git flow, which is uh, a much more advanced workflow. Uh, works. It's better if you have like a, maybe a bigger team or something like that. Um, you could do it as an individual, but it's probably overkill. Uh, a feature branch workflow is probably a nice advanced workflow for someone who's a solo developer. Uh, but if you're working with a team or you're handling like um, uh, releases and things like that on a regular basis, uh, this would probably make a lot more sense. Uh, so basically, it assigns very specific roles to different branches and defines how and when those things should interact. And what we mean is this. So 
you have the master or main production branch, which is what's represented by that the line there that has the blue dots on it. <clears throat> um, we have a hot fixes branch, which would represent any time that something needs to happen fast to fix a, some. You know, we accidentally deployed a change and it broke something, and we need to fix it pronto, right? So we would create a hot fix branch. We would make the change and merge it right back into master. Um, and then, you know, we'd get that fixed. Uh, but most of the time, if you're doing development, because again, master should always be production ready, should be stable. It should be free from error <laughs> as much as possible. Um, most of your work should be done on the develop branch, which is represented by the line that has all the yellow dots. You can see there's a lot more activity on the develop branch. Uh, this is where people are, uh, you know, merging code into and everything kind of goes on the develop branch and then it gets tested. And then when that uh, develop branch, you're like, maybe we're ready to do a release. It'll go into a release branch where it can then be, you know, uh, development can continue, uh, but nothing's going to impact the potential upcoming release. Uh, so you can kind of solidify that, and then it can go to master. Um, yeah, so then we have, you know, of course, the normal feature branches and things like that that would come off of that. So, like I said, a lot more advanced, um, but makes a lot of sense as your team gets bigger, as you have more, uh, you know, if you're actually doing releases versus maybe like pushing changes to a one-off web website, um, if you're actually working on a product, this will <clears throat> this would make more sense. Um, <clears throat> so, in this case, the main branch, like we said, is stable. We get the benefits of being able to collaborate well with pull requests. It's great for frequent releases. Uh, teams can work on specific parts of the code independently without having to. Um, uh, worry too much about conflicts. Um, <clears throat> if you have to support multiple versions concurrently, um, it can be done. Uh, it's just not exactly built in to this, um, but it, it wouldn't be too complicated to do. So what I mean by uh, multiple versions concurrently, if you have like a 1.0 version, maybe it only works on PHP 7. And maybe a 2.0 version only works on version 8. And you're trying to support them both for a while so that things can work for both versions, but they have to be a little different. Um, you know, something like that uh, is what we're talking about with the con for that. Um, and then we kind of demoed this, but the fork and merge where a developer would create their own copy of a repository. There's two ways of doing pull requests, by the way. Uh, you can do a pull request from <clears throat> from the same repository, which is what I gave an example of earlier, or you can create a copy of a repository, which is the example I gave of Gutenberg earlier, where if you were to make a copy of or a fork of Gutenberg, what, what a fork is what they call copying an existing original code base on GitHub. <clears throat> um, so you can... You, you can kind of go two ways with this, but the fork and merge is usually more of the open source approach where you've got one repository and this represents that repository's code. Um, and then you end up creating a copy of the repository, which essentially serves as a feature branch. And then when you're done making your changes, you do a pull request from your repository to the original repository, and that will essentially apply those changes. So, um, so cloning is making a local copy of a repository, which is usually your own repository that you have access to. Um, forking is basically going into, to, um, let me give, give a more solid example here. Forking is where you would say, okay, let's go to, uh, let's come over here. We'll go to WordPress slash Gutenberg. And I'm going to create, it actually has a button here that says fork. You can click fork. 
and it will say, let's see, this will be, what, say Bluehost or whatever. So you, I actually already have a copy of it, but um, so you could say, well, you know, we're going to make a copy of the Gutenberg repo and then go from there. Um, so that's the idea of a fork. Um, so the, the idea there is, and let's take a closer look at this. The idea here is um, the primary repository stays clean. It's also uh, stays separate and, you know, no one that you don't want to make changes will make changes to your code. Um, but it is publicly accessible and other people can contribute. And assuming you accept those contributions, then the code can be added um, to the code base. Uh, so primary repo stays clean, limits to your write access. You still have that collaboration ability. So this is why, again, it's great for open source. Um, it is a little bit more work and it's slightly more complicated. So you do have to understand a few more things before you kind of get into that workflow. Um, but um, but again, so I think you, you just kind of have to take it one step at a time. If you're just starting out, start with a basic workflow. If you want to contribute to an open source project, learn the fork and merge workflow. If you want to learn a more advanced solo developer workflow, the feature branch workflow works great. If you have a team and you're doing product work and you're doing releases and things like that, then the get flow uh, is a good workflow. Um, so uh, I think we're almost out of time, but there's just a few quick best practices here that I want to run through <clears throat> and we will um, end it with that. So. For best practices, uh, when you're doing a commit, make sure that your commit uh, makes logical sense, right? So you don't want to be committing, oh yeah, this line of that and that line of this, and they're all random different changes, but we're going to mash them all in there together anyway. Keep them separate, keep them logical, um, like I did with uh, a commit for version changes, which was multiple lines, and then maybe a commit for the year change, different things like that. Um, you want to keep your commit small and incremental as possible. Um, it's going to make it easier to kind of track track changes, especially if you're a new developer. Those little changes, if you get too carried away trying to make bigger changes and you don't commit frequently, you will completely break things and, and you won't be able to figure out why. Um, and you want to make sure the commit messages are descriptive. Don't just say test or updated or change something. Uh, make sure you say you know, what it is that you changed. If you're creating a branch, you want to create a branch for every feature, big feature that you do, uh, which again could also be a bug fix. When you're done merging that, it's uh, to keep things nice and clean. You want to delete the branch when you're done. And then uh, again, make sure that the main branch is for your stable production code only. Uh, for tagging, uh, releases typically are what you're using tags for. And you should be using semantic versioning. If you're not familiar with that, you should look it up. There's an entire website dedicated to semantic version. I believe it's simver.org. <clears throat> and then we have pull requests. So pull requests are where other people will be looking at your code most likely before it gets merged in. Uh, just to avoid mental fatigue, you should try to limit the, the amount of code being reviewed at any given time to 200 lines of code. If that means you need to create a branch um, for your feature and then an, uh, like an integration branch that occasionally you say, hey, I've made some more changes. I'm not done yet, but I want you to look at them. Um, it's a good way to kind of piecemeal and make those things a little smaller. Um, but again, uh, pull requests can be created across branches or, repo or repositories, um, <clears throat> but they should be created only for code that is actually ready to be merged. If it's not ready to be merged, there is something called a draft pull request uh, that, that would be the way to do that. Uh, refactoring, if you're renaming and moving files around, um, you should do that in its own pull request. If you're reformatting code, you should do that in its own pull request. Uh, if you do that in conjunction with actual code changes, it gets very hard for somebody doing a code review to, to identify the actual lines of code that were changed versus just everything having different indentation or files getting renamed and stuff like that. 
if you have dependencies, don't uh, version control those. Uh, you do want to track the de dependency versions, but maybe not the actual code that itself. Uh, this is what tools like Composer are for, uh, is to be able to track dependencies. So uh, learning about Composer and then um, how to exclude something from a, a Git repository. So if we take a quick peek here at the... Uh, the code here. So we have a .git ignore file. The .git ignore file will take a, a file name or a path, and that will make sure that those things don't end up in the repository itself. They may exist in the file structure, but they won't be added to the repository. Um, all right, so switching, switch back here. <clears throat> um, and likewise, with files that are generated, so let's say you're using SAS and you're generating CSS files, you don't actually want to commit the CSS files, just the SAS files. Uh, and then ideally, you'll have some sort of build process when you deploy the code that will generate those files for you. Um, you want your branch names to be descriptive. This is kind of a, an example of how I like to prefix things to add a new feature, to update, or maybe do a bug fix. Uh, or to try something as an experiment. Um, and then finally, uh, requiring, let's see, uh, requiring PRs to merge into the mer the main branch. Um, so you can you can set up restrictions on GitHub where somebody can't just push directly to the production branch. Uh, so to enforce, a better workflow where someone is required to open a PR first and then to um, have that approved and then merged, uh, which typically you can set up some workflows as well, where if a PR is opened, pull request is opened, uh, it will run some automated tests or something like that to validate that things aren't broken. Um, that introduces a much better workflow than having a few people who are like, willy-nilly, hey, I'll just commit this to our production code without actually having anybody look at it or that kind of thing. Um, and lastly, you want to make sure that you clearly document how your team uses Git. Um, so again, with this list of best, best practices, you know, clearly outlining what your expectations are around that um, <clears throat> helps everybody to, to work together in a, in a reasonable fashion. Uh, so here's a few resources. I will, um, by the way, I will post the link to the slides on the Meetup uh, page in the comment section uh, after this. But um, so as we mentioned, we've got Git, GitHub. There's also something called GitHub CLI, not to be confused with the Git CLI, which is what Git is. Uh, GitHub CLI actually allows you to do things like create pull requests from the CLI. Um, which is not normally something you can do, but if you really love command line, you can do it. Uh, source tree, which is the graphical tool that we've been using. Uh, uh, this link actually has a bunch of other links on it. So if you don't use version control and I piqued your interest and you wanna learn more, there's entire tutorials and walkthroughs and classes and things like that that are actually at this link. Um, and there's a link here that kind of goes through some of the workflows we talked about in a little more detail. Uh, Git flow specifically, uh, the original post from the guy who kind of came up with it, uh, and something called Git bisect, which is also a really cool way of having some automated ways of jumping around the code to figure out where bugs exist. So uh, something we didn't have time for today, but definitely worth looking into. So uh, with that, uh, I think we are basically done because that was a lot, but uh, if anybody does have questions, feel free to ping me on uh, Twitter at WP Scholar, or you can go to WPScholar.com and submit a question through a contact form. Uh, but I do appreciate uh, everybody who could make it. And um, yeah, like I said, I'll post the, post the slides.